Welcome everyone to Cisco Canada's webinar. We're very excited to have the gentleman from restaurant owner on the line, Jim and Joe, and uh, totally welcome to our webinar. And we're so happy to have you guys on here. Well, thank you, Jay. Yep. Thank you very much. Looking forward to it. That's awesome. Well, we're going to talk about some stuff around the COVID-19 and definitely around cutting costs and cash flow. And I tell you, this is so critical. As we know, a lot of operators are going through some really uh, mm -hmm. unbelievable change in their worlds. So I'm going to let you guys take over and really share with us some of the information that you have today. And just thanks again for being on our show today. You bet, Jay. Thank you. Time. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, we have been spending time doing webinars and programs and talking to our members about uh, health and safety issues and delivery and carry out and meal replacement and things of that nature. Uh, but for this program to today, we're going to focus on financial issues because the real problem facing many business owners is sadly getting down to the point where, you know, what do I do to save my business? Um, how do we make it financially through this, uh, through these difficult times and at least stop the bleeding long enough, long enough to give us the opportunity to open up and become healthy again. So um, what I want to, I think, start off with um, is uh, folks, we're in, we're in uncharted territory right now. There is no script or playbook for the current economic and business problems that we're dealing with um, because the scope and magnitude is just, I mean, you know, sure, people have had financial issues in the past to deal with, we deal with in businesses, have, have dealt with cash flow and things of that nature, but we're all, de we're all dealing with it at the same time. But there's some principles and some tools that I think that you can use that will help you in your thinking and planning as you navigate and try to survive this crisis. So, um, so that's what we're going to do. So let's go ahead and get into our, uh, into our materials here. Um, uh, he, here's what we're going to talk about. There are really three three big topics here. First of all, creating a cash flow plan. Um, that has got to be, we believe that this has got to be one of your highest priorities. You've got to have a plan. You've got to know what the next three to six, probably 12 weeks are going to look like cash flow wise so that you don't, don't get yourself in a bind, for example, and can't make payroll or something of that nature um, that will cause you... Um, cause you to be in a crisis mode, even, even more than what you're in right now. So create a cash flow plan. Next is, is extreme cost cutting. Let's get rid of every single type of, of cost that we, that is not absolutely essential to keep us operating our business in a limited type of format. And if we're, and if we're shut down right now, let's go ahead and jettison as many costs as possible so that we can, when we, when things open up, um, we have conserved as much financial resources as we possibly can. And then the third point is to know your break-even point. What do we need to do right now with limited operations, if that's what you're dealing with, to at least cover those essential expenses um, and uh, uh, so that it is it worth remaining open or is it not worth uh, remaining open? So um, let me just real quickly... My, I'm Jim Laub, as uh, as Jay said. I'm here with my partner, uh, Joe Erickson. We uh, 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 we run RestaurantOwner.com, and uh, um, uh, we we want to encourage you, welcome you to check out our website if you like. We've got all types of different resources to support you in the area of financial management, uh, employee training, uh, uh, the menu engineering, cost control. Uh, fin all sorts of different things. And uh, um, we have a special COVID-19 resources page and it's free. It's, it's, you're, you're welcome to go there. We update it daily. It's, uh, we've done surveys. We have other, we have re webinar recordings that we've done in the past, uh, industry uh, resources, um, safety information. So you're welcome to go ahead and, uh, and, and view those resources if, if, if you'd like. Um, we're going to go ahead. I'm going to zip through that real, real quickly, and I'm going to zip through that. And uh, I'm going to start off here talking about a cash flow worksheet. And if you're not familiar with this, there's four main, four main parts to it. Um, 
uh, you start with a beginning cash balance. In other words, the cash that you have on hand. And then what you're going to do is you're going to project your cash inflows. That's, that's part two. Your cash outflows and come up with an ending cash balance for every week. And you can see that we recommend that you do at least a 12-week cash flow projection. And your ending balance one week is going to be your beginning balance to the next week. And what it does, it gives you a glimpse into the future. And the value is in letting you see the timing of your cash receipts, your projected cash receipts and disbursements, your payments, and what impact that's going to likely impact that's going to have on your cash flow. And, and, and what it does, it gives you time. It gives you options that if you see yourself with a week, for example, that you may have uh, payroll due, you may have credit card payments due, you may have utilities due, for example. Um, what can I do if I know that's, that that's coming? What can I do about it ahead of time so that I don't get caught in a real crisis situation? So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about cash inflows and how that would work. First of all, you've got to know your cash balance every single day. And that's not just how much cash you have in the bank. That is the amount of cash you have in the bank minus any outstanding checks that you have. So you need to have a, 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 a cash book or whatever so that you know how much cash you're dealing with. Because, folks, cash is like oxygen. Um, it, you don't really notice your, your breathing until you don't have any oxygen anymore, and then it becomes a big problem. Well, cash is the same way in a uh, same way to, to, to a business. Um, the, the, the next part of it is uh, uh, you're going to have cash from credit card receipts. You're going to have uh, cash coming in from, from sales. And what you're going to do, you're, you're going to project that for every week. So, for example, if your tra uh, sales are, are, are trending up a little bit from your delivery, from your takeout operations, put that amount of money in there. Put that amount of cash in there for each week that you, you project so you have a sense of that. You may have a uh, 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 value added taxes or, or, or what we would call in the U.S. a sales tax in addition to your actual sales, the money that you actually get to keep. Um, you would account for that as well on this line item right here. Also, you may have certain expenses right now that you're paying in cash out the back door. Uh, that's it may be for for certain vendors or whatever, but you'd you'd go ahead and project that and estimate what that's going to run you every week as well. There's also a line for loan proceeds. If you see in the future, you expect some sort of financial assistance or loans from banks or lenders or whatever, or maybe even owner uh, uh, investor contributions, there is a line for, for that as well. So those are your cash, uh, cash sources. Um, next, we have our cash outflows. And we've put this into, in kind of a P&L type order. And what we've done is we've, we've, if you're on limited operations right now and maybe doing delivery and takeout and that's it, um, we've tried to highlight or put in red those what we would consider essential expenses, things that you have to pay to keep what operations you do have going to keep those going. Those are things like food and paper and possibly beer, liquor and wine uh, if you're selling the, those types of items. So you'd project each week, what you think you're going to spend to cover the cost of your food and uh, food and paper. Uh, next, we would have payroll. So in other words, your labor costs and any type of taxes associated that you need to pay uh, along, with, along with payroll. Uh, then we have benefits. And I'm sure you have certain categories of benefits in the, in the Canadian market that you deal with. But anything having to do with labor costs go ahead and stick that in that category. Then we have the payment of, of our sales taxes, any type of liquor taxes that you pay that generally we don't get any uh, uh, allowance on in terms, of, in, ter in terms of payment. If you are allowed additional time, obviously take that into consideration when you would, uh, when you would, pay, when you would pay that. Utilities, most utilities, are you're going to have to go ahead and pay those on a regular basis. You've got to keep the lights on. You've got to keep it heated and cooled and so on. Uh, cleaning supplies, that's another very, very necessary expense right now for obvious reasons. Sanitation is uh, absolutely crucial. 
and uh, uh, rent you may not be paying. You maybe get some sort of allowance or deferment or abatement on rent. So we did we didn't consider that as a as a critical expense in most cases, depending on your situation. Uh, if we go down a little bit further, we see there's credit cards, and that would be the credit your business credit cards. Um, you may not be able to pay the full amount, but obviously you're going to be paying some portion of your credit card bills on a regular payment as well. And then finally, we have a, uh, a category that eventually those payables that you haven't been able to pay um, because your business was ongoing and all of a sudden, bingo, your sales stopped, your cash flow stopped. So you probably have some past due payables that eventually you're going to have to pay. Once you make a, uh, an arrangement with your with certain suppliers and vendors, you can go ahead and plug those amounts that you commit to uh, into your cash flow worksheet as well. So, um, so what your worksheet will look like is something like this. I've gone ahead and just put some numbers in here for the first four weeks. I highly encourage you to take it all the way out the full 12 weeks. Now, is it going to be accurate? 100%? No, absolutely not. This is a... Uh, this is a best guess as of right now. And even though it's not going to be 100% correct, I guarantee you it's 1,000 times more valuable than not doing anything at all. For example, here in week three, you can see that we have several payments that are due the same week. We've got payroll. We've got uh, 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 some taxes that are due the same week. And if we don't do something, we're going to have a cash flow problem. We're going to have a crisis on our hands. So, And here's the benefit. We know now, let's say we're in week one, if we know that we're going to have that problem in week three, we have time to strategize, we have time to talk to people, we have time to reschedule uh, payments and things of that nature, and uh, um, that's we're being much more professional in terms of how we're handling that. Um, one of the key strategies, as you can probably tell, is to defer. How What can we put off and pay tomorrow rather than having to pay today so we can stay operational and we can at least have some cash to pay our necessary bills to keep the uh, uh, the restaurant open. Um, uh, to to kind of summarize why you need to do this now is uh, uh, it will help you think strategically. I know that when this crisis started in the and, and the dining rooms were, uh, were, were closed and operations were closed. I mean, we were just frantic. We just had to, you, you did what you needed to do just to, just to get to the next day or actually get through the next hour or two. Um, now let's take a little bit of a longer view. Uh, a, a cash flow worksheet that goes out 12 weeks will help you think strategically. It will also help you see reality. It will help you see what kind of shape you're actually in from a cash flow standpoint. It'll also, as I said earlier, give you time and options to work on potential crisis times that are down the road. It'll give you time to do that, to make arrangements, and it'll help you create a plan. And right now, your banker, your landlords, your lenders, um, your vendors and suppliers, one thing they want to know, they want to know, do you have a plan? And Another thing in that regard, too, in terms of your vendors and your suppliers and bankers, it's very, very important to communicate with them because silence, silence erodes trust. Let me repeat that. Silence erodes trust. They want to hear from you. They don't want to have to chase you down to find out what's going on. And what they will want to know is that whether or not you have a plan or whether or not you're at least working on a plan to make them whole eventually. Very, yeah. very important going forward. Joe, do you have a comment? Uh, I do actually, Jay. Oh, oh okay, Jay. I, I didn't want to interrupt because we'll make this no, like a no, four hour, anytime. Four hour yeah. webinar. Um, but I do want to just, I think that's such a great, these are so good, amazing points, but that last one there, mm -hmm. it hit me right between the eyes because one of the things I always talk about when I do my lectures across Canada is to have a strategy and a plan mm. and and i've met with thousands of restaurateurs across this country and i bet you i could count on a couple hands if you know if i feel um i feel like i'm i'm i'm, I'm maybe overstating that but i don't believe a lot of people have a plan and i right. think a lot of people get scared by it mm -hmm. and, and a little nervous about creating a plan do you have anything that's simple i think the the state what you said there that comment that quote um, that erodes trust. 
is there anything in a sense that you want to mention just about creating a plan? I always say it doesn't have to be huge. It, it could be very simple on what you're going to do with your strategy. Right. You got to have something. Yeah. Right. Well, right. I've been in this situation before. <laughs> For, <laughs> so I, I, you know, one of the, one of the, the approaches you have to take there is that sometimes restaurants and it didn't take a COVID crisis to find this out. Sometimes we get in cash flow issues and the objective is you got to keep the doors open. So you got to keep the product coming in. So typically when you have a payables, that's, that's greater than your, in your weekly intake, you need to be able to have a plan and be able to satisfy the vendors to, to that balance may not be knocking down, but we've got to at least pay what we're doing each week. We don't want to keep going further in the hole. So mm -hmm. the plan ultimately would be, let me continue to pay for what I'm getting and slowly knock down the other balance until we can get mm -hmm. past this crisis. That would be a plan that is actually the only plan you can really do when mm -hmm. you're faced with um, a, a big payables number and no revenue to cover for it. And and that, that that's a good point, Joe. And Jay, I really think that the cash flow worksheet is really the basis of your yeah. plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's really you're, what you're, you're yeah. down to. Yeah. You're, you're yeah. right, Jim. And and that's yeah. why I think it's so uh, yeah. such a great subject and a great thing to bring up. And we're gonna give everybody this template, and it's really a very simple Excel template, and um it's it's really easy. I mean, it won't take any time at all for somebody to be able to, you know, plug their numbers in and all oh, we have the formulas in. So it adds up the columns and stuff like that. Um, you can add and edit and really do anything you want with it. So right. it is a very, very simple tool. We, we mm -hmm. obviously designed that intentionally. Yeah. And yeah. especially where he has the payment plans on there, you see that. And that's where one that would uh, would follow what I was saying is that if you consider that whatever you're doing in business, you're going to pay for that as you go. But the plan might say that I'm going to, you know, can I knock that down 5% a week or 2% or 10%, whatever that number is, that's uh, agreeable with, you know, whichever vendor you're dealing with or group of vendors. Correct. Correct. So we're going to make this, this worksheet available to everybody. Um, we'll make sure that, uh, um, Jay, that you have uh, the, uh, uh, the link where people can download it. Mm -hmm. um, we have another tool that Joe's going to talk about in a few minutes that we call our cash flow break even calculator as well. So, um, so yeah, this is going to be available to everybody. Okay. It's, a, it's so good. And I think All right. it's so simple to do. And it is. And the thing is, yeah. you get better at it. The more you do it, the better you get. And we would recommend uh, operators update their cash flow, their 12 week cash flow worksheet every single week. Okay. And there might be someone on your staff that can do this while you're working. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It, yeah. it is not, it's not rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> hey, one thing about it, it all evolves around the checkbook. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, you know, yes. yeah. Absolutely. And for those operators that do go to their banker and vendor and suppliers and stuff and said, I'm working on a plan. In fact, here's my plan. I'll share it with you. This is my reality. And we have operators that are doing that. Um, you will be perceived as heads, shoulders above anywhere, probably 90% of your peers, as you were alluding to earlier, Jay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know yeah. what? It, it, as simple as it is, it's so important. Yep. Yeah. It's so, so important. It's crucial. It's, it, Absolutely it's, crucial. It's better than the plan. Say, can I give you a check for dated next week? And will you can't wait to cash it? We hear that all the time, right? <laughs> exactly. It just doesn't work. Okay, that's yeah, not a plan. Talk <laughs> no, about it won't work with the future either. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I also want to tell people about other uh, training resources. Uh, there's a there's a consulting group in the in the U.S. Uh, by the name of Results Through Strategy, mm -hmm. and we can give you a link to there. They've got a really good cash flow. Uh, 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 a worksheet. It's a little bit more sophisticated. Probably multi-unit operators would like this one, uh, and they and they go through uh, a, a discussion of how to actually use it. So that's available. And there's also another one for anybody that's interested in a two full two-hour cash flow management education. Um, we, we'll go ahead and give you information on sending people to that as well. And they have another. Uh, a tool. It's a cloud-based tool that, again, is a little bit more sophisticated than the results through strategy, 
for, for bigger operators that want to uh, get into more detail and have more bells and whistles with their, uh, with their projection. Okay, so that's available as well. Uh, let's go ahead and turn our attention now to extreme cost cutting. And we're going to walk right straight through the P&L and we're going to talk about things that we've learned that operators are doing uh, to, to make the most of everything that they have and to cut their, cut their expenses to the bone, essentially. Not cut, the, not cut through the bone, but cut to the bone, everything that's not absolutely, absolutely ne necessary. And we're first going to talk about the big... Uh, you know, the big area, which would be your food products. And we could go on and on about things to do. That you, and it, it's a lot of the normal things that you do to conserve and to uh, uh, make the most of your food products. But now more than ever, you really need to know what's moving and what's not. And you got to get rid of that dead product that's just taken up space and possibly subject to spoiling eventually, uh, uh, spoiling at, at, at some point in your storage areas. So know what's moving. Buy only what you absolutely need. Take into consideration how many deliveries you get. What's the very minimum you need to get to the next reorder day so that you have the chance to utilize uh, the maximum amount of the product that you do get. Um, and that ties right into controlling inventory levels, uh, which becomes absolutely crucial uh, in times like these. Joe, do you have any com more comments? And Jay, too, uh, in terms of making the most of the food that we do have on the shelf. Yes, and I think, I think uh, Jim, thank you. The, the idea there, this is one thing that would point towards your menu and what kind of pairing down of, of limited menus and multiple use out of ingredients. And that, that analysis that um, to, for this time period, maybe it's your entire menu is not what you need to be offering. You need to be focusing on what could move. Uh, through takeout and delivery and, and whatever business you are able to do. And this is where you kind of really need to examine it. Uh, you may want to sell off that inventory like you would groceries. Uh, there's a, a, a lot you can do if you really look at it and see what are the main things that sell and what few ingredients can I use so I can use those things in multiple places. Very good. Okay. You know, Jim, Jim yeah, I just want to mention on there something yeah. else is um, – I'd be very cautious on the amount of food products you bring in based on theft as well. Mm -hmm. right? Because as we get into dire times and you have all this food sitting in your kitchens, you're running big inventories, you're not keeping track of it. We know we know people don't mean to steal during these times, or maybe they do. I don't know. But I think it's something that you need to be very cautious. And why I, I would want to do in my restaurants is to control levels is based on watching theft. Right, right, and, right. right and, we know this; those things happens in critical yeah, times. Good point. Yeah. And, and and what a lot of operators are doing, Jay and Jim, is uh, uh, they have this excess inventory. They know that they're not going to be able to produce this menu items. They're going to have ingredients that they're not going to be using, and they don't know for how long. It could be, you know, is it weeks? Is it months? You know, we know that this is an indefinite time period, and so many of them think of about it as a marketing tool. So they will give them to food banks and community service. And they'll give, yeah. I'd rather, I'd rather give it away and get some kind of benefit where I give back to the community and help someone than I would for someone to steal it and take it home. So there's lots you can do. And then when the time comes to replenish that and you're open for business or you're expanding what you're doing, that's when you can, you know, replenish your shelves with the essentials. Great point. And, and, and that's a really good point, Joy. And I think, I'm sorry to make this such a long webinar, but one mm -hmm. thing also I just want to mention is, the idea about your smaller menus, and we've seen that in a lot of places in Canada where they are scaling it down just to, uh, you know, it's like 12 items on a menu. Now, what we've seen and discussed is we've shifted a little bit from the customer experience being a physical and body experience to more of a food experience replacing that. So what we've seen is they've adjusted down to a very single one-page menu um, and, and created like, you know, 10, 12 items on that menu. But they're readjusting that menu through the weeks now. And then they're posting that online. So they're actually adjusting, you know, they're taking things off. They're almost making like an LTO, limit time menu, but that's a regular menu now. So it draws interest into someone wanting to purchase from that location. Because we know millennials or who, you know, like typically men, millennials uh, tend not to reorder from the same place over and over again. So if we can create, um, you know, almost like an experience for the food mm. and it changes and we use social media to produce, you know, pump that out or use our PR channels or our social channels 
to get that message up about our new weekly menu, you could get some repeat customers on there. Because if yep. we know that the restaurants are shrunk, like the amount out there, but I think it's now, how do you get to people to, to I never thought of this until you guys brought these up is how do you get people to repeat to order from you when everything's online now? Like everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right that's where social right. media comes. Yeah. Right. That's, right. You, you, you're, you're right. Having a, having a, a rotating or having a constantly changing menu to keep people interested is, yeah, that's a brilliant idea. Yeah. When people cannot go out to eat at their leisure. Okay. They need to, they're looking for answers because people still want to have an experience, even if it's at home. Okay. And, yeah, yeah. and so the fact that if, if uh, your, your restaurant all of a sudden may become something different for them. Um, a lot of, a lot of restaurants are finding that they're adding new products uh, or new specials are focusing on just those rotation of, of a particular uh, menu items during the week. Yeah. And they're finding opportunities and we talk, we're talking about cutting cost here, but really you can cut cost on one thing and maybe substitute it with something else. So sometimes pre-prepared products or things like this, that would go well and fit into a family pack meal, for instance, or something else, a product that you wouldn't normally serve in your restaurant may be the appropriate thing when you're doing home meal replacement or you're doing, you're adding home meal replacement and, and, and other things to your regular food preparation. It, it could be a little bit, I hate to say this, but it could be a little bit experimental time here too. It, within, it, within, within your menu. Hey, this whole thing's an experiment. It might as well be, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. That's all right, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I'll be quiet. That's okay. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. Okay, what about beverages? Um, stock only what you sell. You may be not, you may not be, be selling a lot of certain types of liquors and wines or uh, uh, certain things. And, and maybe there's an opportunity to return some of that liquor and wine. I know we have operators in the U S that have, they pay a little bit of a restocking fee, but they've been, they've been able to, to, uh, to return a lot of unopened boxes back to their suppliers and guess what that frees up, frees up cash. Yeah. So, so that's a possibility. Also suspending CO2 service. If you're not using your CO2, uh, uh si system right now. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, paper products, and paper products now are a cost of sales for uh, for many restaurants, whereas, whereas before it wasn't because they're selling a lot of products, because almost everything's going out with paper now. Um, and are you balancing costs with quality? And I know that's a, that's a judgment call, but uh, are you getting the very, very best deals on the paper products that really fit your concept and your customer expectations? Um, he, here's a little negotiation uh, tip that might come in handy. Um, if you get a price from somebody or a bid, say something like this, say, you know, my situation, is that the best that you can do? Just that question right there will get them thinking, could I cut a little bit more or could I give this person a little bit better deal or maybe a little bit better payment terms? And after you get a little bit better of a deal, try one more time, say, would you please check and see if that's the very best that you can do instead of accepting the bid, the initial bid as the, as the final one, it doesn't hurt to ask. And I can almost promise you that you will save $10, maybe $50, maybe a hundred dollars here and there. And maybe it's not a lot, um, at one time, but I guarantee you those little tens and fives and fifties and hundreds or 75s will add up the big dollars over the weeks and months ahead. Because I promise you folks, you're going to be doing a lot of negotiating in the next several months um, on, a, in, on a lot of different things. So try to get the best possible price in terms. Uh, personnel labor cost. Um, and this is really a tough area because this is where we have relationships and this is where our emotions kick in. But you still have to make tough decisions and make serious cuts. But first of all, we highly recommend, like with your uh, suppliers and, and, and your bankers, um, communicate open and often with your people. Critically, crit critically important. Uh, commit to them that you're going to keep them informed on, uh, informed on what's going on. And tell them how hard you're working to save the restaurant, that you've considered hundreds of different ideas and operating scenarios, and you're working intently on figuring out what's going to work and what's going to keep you afloat. Um, 
And if you do that and get them in the loop, for one thing it does, it keeps the rumor mill from, uh, um, from, from churning, but it also gets them involved. It, it gives you the opportunity to tell them, for us to make it, we need you to be frugal and diligent and ener energetic. And when you're here, we need your best effort all the time. And it's going to be bumpy for the next few few months, but we're going to do our best, our very very best to keep to keep to keep you around, um, and and maybe that's not possible. So because the reality is, financial wise, cash flow wise, um, you've got to realign your labor costs with your current sales volume. Um, there, there's just no other way around it. Um, so that when you do have to make cuts, um, when you do have to make those difficult decisions, you got to think about your company. You've got to do your best to retain your A players first, the people that really make your restaurant work. Um, uh, and you can't feel guilty about that because because that's a tough decision. That that's what um, that's what owners, that's what uh, key executives, that's those are the types of decisions that come into play in times like these so instead of focusing on retaining a work for workforce you've got to focus on doing what it takes to survive and i think that's my last point here you must focus on what it's going to take for your business to survive joe any G comments on yeah that? jim i wanted to say back to that top one would communicate openly and often with your people and yeah. this is so important that we've had a lot of members uh, uh tell us how they're using the current technology they have with their scheduling software which has their ability to constantly communicate with their staff and the people still have it on their apps a lot mm -hmm. of the times and they're constantly updating them every day with something new that happened just that constant communication that ends up on on someone's cell phone or their hip or maybe their email or whatever, but just hearing from them on a regular basis is so important um, and will be for the lifetime of your restaurant. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. OK. All right. Let's get into some other expense categories. We call this direct operating expenses, and it includes all those miscellaneous operating expenses like banquet and catering, bar utensils, cleaning supplies and all that all those sorts of things. And we just kind of identified what we would think that would be crucial. Uh, they're in yellow here. You got to have cleaning supplies that we talked about earlier. Uh, the kitchen's got to have their tools. Uh, you probably want to keep the pest away. Although being in Canada, that's probably not a, not a big issue right now anyway, but it will be in the summertime. So um, uh, just some help, help in, in those areas. And I would encourage you to go through Ask your accountant or your bookkeeper for your general ledger, your general ledger transa or transaction detail, where you can go in and see every single invoice, every single purchase that you made within these categories and think about, okay, is this essential or not essential? And just stop paying for, stop buying those, those items that just aren't essential right now to get through to the next day. You also probably have a category called music and entertainment that would include uh, uh, what you pay to have music in your business, whether it's uh, it's live or licensing fees, or maybe you have uh, television, televisions, direct TV or cable and things of that nature. Um, go through those. And do you really need to be spending money on those uh, on those items right now? Probably not. You can probably save money there in terms of marketing. Uh, <clears throat> Maybe your loyalty program, in fact, your loyalty program right now is probably worth gold. So you probably want to keep paying those bills. But go to your loyalty uh, program uh, and say, uh, can you, is there anything you can do do for us right now? Um, can, you, can you maybe give us a deferment on your monthly payments or something like that? Um, social media, obviously a lot of social media is is free. You may be doing it on your own, or you may be having a service do it for you. And now may be a, a good time to learn how you, how to do it, or maybe have somebody on your staff do it. So you can keep communicating with your customers on Instagram and, and, uh, in Facebook, but just not spend a lot of money doing it. Uh, utilities, obviously utilities need to be paid. Uh, but do you need to be paying the same amount for your trash removal? Uh, probably not because there's a lot less trash going out to the dumpster. Um, 
uh, in terms of electricity and gas, are you being diligent and in, in, do you have systems for turning off unused equipment? Not, not only turning it on until it's absolutely needed, turning lights off when those rooms aren't, aren't being, uh, uh, nobody's using those rooms or something, really controlling your heating and cooling. Um, and another area is even though you're incurring those expenses, is there a way possibly, maybe not, to defer some of those payments? So that's a, that's a possibility. They're general and administrative expenses. Now, um, accounting and payroll, you're probably going to keep doing that. But we've heard stories of accountants saying, look, you don't pay me for the next month or two. I want to do what I can to help, uh, to help you guys. Um, uh, professional services, maybe you're going to need an attorney or something like that. Um, certain telephone expenses or something are probably going to be necessary. But everything else, printing and postage and and look in detail at the of those of those expenses and uh, and see if you have things, especially in the dues and subscriptions area, that may be recurring that you really don't have to have right now. Anything is up for uh, is up for grabs, is up for uh, uh, eliminating if you absolutely don't have to have it. Um, and then there's rent, uh, which is a huge one. And uh, a couple comments on rent. The question is, do we go to our landlord and ask for a deferment or an abatement? Deferment is just putting it off. Abatement is a, re a permanent reduction. Um, we would push, we would encourage you. You need to do what you need to do to survive. And one of those things is you cannot afford to pay the rent that you were paying six weeks ago, two months ago. You just can't do it. And I guarantee you, your landlord does not want an empty restaurant space because there's nobody in line to take that over right now. And there probably won't be for many, many months. So we would encourage you to push for some type of abatement, um, maybe no rent for two or three months, or maybe at half, or maybe at whatever you can negotiate. Again, it's all up for grabs, grabs, folks. And we're talking about big dollars here. So get with your um, your business advisors, maybe talk to your attorney or whatever, but develop a plan for saving money, for not paying any more rent than you absolutely have to, because you can't afford to pay much and you probably won't be able to afford to pay much for the next several months, at least. Um, uh, some areas that we know are suspending evictions. We have some states in the U.S. is and uh, you just can't evict anybody, even a commercial lease. Um, so there are many, many restaurants that are not paying, uh, not paying uh, any rent at all right now. Um, now it's up to debate wh when and if that is ever going to be due, maybe at the end of the lease or whatever. But again, we're doing what we need to do to survive, to get to the next week, next week, next week, and so on. So hopefully things will get, uh, will get better. And, and also when you talk to your, talk to your land, your landlord may not be a bad guy or a bad person. Um, and uh, uh, let them tell them, hey, look, I'm operating on 20% of sales as, as uh, 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 my sales are down 80%. So I'm running on 20%. I cannot afford uh, the, uh, uh, the rent right now and use that as a basis for, for trying to get some sort of an abatement type pro program going. And, th and there again, if you have a plan for survival, if you can show the landlord possibly what you could afford to pay once things reopen, then you've got credibility. Then you've uh, then you've got a way to work together to try to uh, both sa satisfy each other's needs and uh, and work things out for the best. Um, in addition to rent, there's a uh, insurance on building and contents that is going to be important. You do not want to let your insurance uh, uh, policies lapse. But here again, um, here's an opportunity possibly to go and if there are payments due, get some sort of a deferral on those uh, on those payments. Jim? Yes. Can I, can Jay? I yeah. a question here? I just, just thinking of this when you brought through occupational yeah. costs. Is it possible, let's say I'm a restaurant and, and we have a, it probably happens more than we probably even think of up here in Canada, but if I have, um, I'm a restaurant, I closed, um, I shut down, I, I could afford my, my, my rent and my location mm -hmm. and I decided to 
pretty much shut down and I'm not sure if I'm going to open up again. But you're, but you, and we do know that this industry is is definitely linked into other locations. So you may know someone else that has an operation that's open. Mm-hmm. Is it possible to help with occupational costs? Is to offer up your kitchen to run other brands out of it. So you almost become a cooperative kitchen to support some of these costs that you bring in someone that shut down right now to lend them your kitchen. Uh, Jay, I would say it's the wild west right now. <laughs> and unless there's something in your in your lease that says you can't do that. Yeah. And even if there is, um, you go to your landlord and say, look, I'm, I, I need to do, you know, we need to do this to survive. Um, I would say this is where the creativity of our industry com- mm-hmm. uh, comes in. We've heard about one operator. They opened up six virtual kitchens out of their existing restaurant. Yeah. Right. So they're operating all multiple concepts out of their, out of their operations, mm-hmm. which is brilliant. So any way that you can utilize unutilized kitchen capacity, I think is, yeah. Well, because it could be on volume too. The, even the one that's there already, like you said, you had twenty percent. Yep. If if you go, well, can I borrow? To the, you know, I'll take another twenty of that twenty percent. Mm-hmm. I'll come in there now. At least that location is running forty percent operational. Like it's right. you're pulling some yep. cost into it, right? Mm-hmm. So, and like you said, it could you could um, generate a lot of new interest within this. Now you're running two brands out of one location. Yep. So it draws more interest when you come into marketing and strategies to pull more people to that hub. You're you're creating these, oh, I wouldn't say forest, maybe, um, community kitchens yep. from kitchens that are standing up right now. Yep. And you're supporting each other through it as well. Mm-hmm. Jay, I think the industry is going to see a whole lot more cooperative type stuff like that going on. Right. So right. Yep. Well, and that's why it's so important when we talk about a cash flow, you know, cash flow is uh, two things, incoming cash, outgoing cash, and the creativity of the incoming cash is what we're, what we're seeing now when people started opening up the grocery pantries or home meal replacements and things like you just talked about, Jay, maybe some type of revenue share that uh, could be balanced like that by, by being a a, a virtual kitchen or a, a, a shared kitchen with the, with those things. And that's why it's important that you, when you, these ideas come into play, that they get reflected into your overall cash plan to see what it's going to take, you know, uh, what I need to bring in, what I need, what's going out. So. Very interesting. I think when you look back and I don't know if you, get, you have as much down there, but I mean, in Canada after, and I, I'm not a big fan of always going back to the 1930s, the dirty thirties, to reference where we are today I, i'm just not a fan of that because i think today is way different back then they had dirt roads we have paved roads way different world the one thing i do want to think though when you look at the 1930s the cooperative brand came out of that time mm. and where i was born and raised the co-op as a, as a central location was very big and everyone paid into it and it came from the 30s right it was a big movement the co-ops up here um and they're very successful today but everyone owned a piece of it mm. from public to business. Everyone was very cooperative and they came through the thirties. So I'm wondering if that model, if we can take anything from the history books is to look at that model and consider it for what we're doing within our industry. Cause we're all out there right now, individually, other than some ghost kitchens fighting this battle together, opposed to cooperatively coming together in a sense and supporting each other through this, because at the end of the day, you know, you may be stronger. You got three brands in one kitchen, right? You drawing more interest in there. People are ordering from that same line, or is it? You know, you create a, a cooperative website or whatever it is. You're going to draw more interest into that location um, than you would individually by yourself, fighting the fight by yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're going to see that. Yeah, definitely, Jay. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Great point. Great point. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Joe now, and he's going to talk about calculating your break even, cash flow break even. Yeah. And, uh, you know, first let me start that out by saying, you know, typically when we open a restaurant or we're doing a business plan, you know, one of the key numbers we like to know is what is our break even profit margin? What is our break even? Uh, what number is, what amount of sales do we need to do each day to sustain 
our, our, our debt load and our cost and our payroll and everything else. And so a lot of times we'll see a sheet that kind of looks like what you're seeing on the screen right now is that it will have a mixture of fixed cost that you establish and then your variable cost that you establish. And of course, our variable cost in, 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 in most cases is your variable cost of food and product and, and paper products, possibly that, you know, in this case now that would be in there. And many times the variable is a certain amount of labor, but here we're looking at a cash flow break even. It's a little bit different. Okay. The difference is that we're, we're not looking at profit margin here. We're looking at cash. Where can we get our cash where it's not draining? As, as Jim uh, pointed out in the cash flow work, uh, statement, we have, you know, the whole idea is, do we have enough cash going into the next week and into the next week and to the next week? Well, the cash flow break even on a, on a, uh, helps us to establish as we're going, kind of knowing if we know what that number is, that as we work through the each day's sales and each week's sales, we know that we're sinking or rising or maintaining uh, uh, where we're at there. So what we provided here, and this is going to be available when you uh, on the page here where you can download this tool as as is the cash flow worksheet, uh, is it, just a little calculations which has some assumptions about your business and then allows those assumptions to fill into the left side, which is a cash flow break even. So it gives you options to it in there. You put in your number of days that you're open per week. Uh, put it, You put in the number of accounting periods that you have. And then we're going to start talking about the things that we know that are that we're going to have fixed cost on there, which start out with your management salary. So we plug in what those management salaries are going to be, what our minimum hourly staffing would be just to open the doors. And then we put a number for benefits, our average cost of sales and packaging cost and things like this and what our credit card percentages were and everything else. And what's not being shown here, there's also assumptions for those numbers on the left, there's a detail, just like Jim went through everything on the PL list. It becomes a checklist, if you will. All those items that he showed you under direct operating expenses, it allows you to put those numbers in so that you know what your, your fixed costs are. And when you do that, you can see in this case that the fixed cost base for this restaurant, before we've actually come into this new period that we're looking into right now might have been uh, $2,879 a day sales that we're looking at on the very bottom side there. Okay. So this restaurant needs to do this much in daily, uh, 20,000 in weekly and 87 basically in a period. So we have a, have a barometer, if you will, to know uh, that if we uh, accurately put in our assumptions about what we need to do to know that we're breaking even. Okay. So, now we go through this entire process of cash flow cutting, and maybe we're to we're able to reduce our rent or defer it, or maybe we're able to um, uh, 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 some municipalities are are uh, uh, deferring utility payments, um, whatever that case could be. Maybe they're loan payments, uh, whatever it is that you can defer. We may want to adjust those. So the assumptions part allows you to put in those new dollars. And if we go to the next slide, oh, you're there already. Okay. So what we, we see a little bit reduced. Well, here we pulled off one of the managers. Um, we uh, reduced our minimum, uh, maximum hourly staff because we're reducing our menu. We don't need as many people to actually open the doors for that day. And maybe we've credited things back like some direct operating expenses. We've cut out marketing uh, except for essentials and music entertainment. Obviously, we don't have any at all going in there. And occupancy, if we were able to defer that rent or abatement, then we can remove those deals. So when you put those items that you're able to renegotiate or defer or abate, you put those new numbers in there and all of a sudden we get another picture that shows that now for cash flow purposes, we've reduced it. To, we only need to do about $1,700 a day to know that we're not going in the hole. Well, this knowing your cash flow break even is the thing that can tell you before you even get to the end of the week if you're going up or down and let you know that there is there any other opportunity to keep reducing those. And as you're able to reduce or eliminate expenses, you keep constantly go back and adjust it and see if you can lower that break even point. Um, so, you know, one of the keys is getting a break even point down to the amount of business you're doing. That's what you're looking for. And then as you do extra business, the idea is to have positive cash flow. So the cash flow break even worksheet allows you to kind of be have a report card, if you will, on a daily basis. And that flows right on into or that 
information is, is going to be reflected right in your weekly cash flow uh, worksheet that Jim showed earlier. Okay. Okay, Joe. Okay, excellent. And uh, uh, let me go to this slide right here. Um, uh, this kind of uh, gets off the financial type track, but I, I guess kind of gets to the heart. Um, how do each of us want to be remembered years after this crisis? And nearly all of us will talk about this in grand terms one day. This is historic. What will each of our roles in this moment, in this moment of history, what will each of our roles in this moment, what will be each of our <laughs> of history? Sorry. That's right. <clears throat> so um, what I wanted to uh, uh, the point I wanted to make here kind of in closing and we'll we'll have some final comments about uh, cash flow and expense reduction and financial issues in just a minute. But uh, um, the next few weeks and months, folks, is really going to be crucial for many of us on many levels. And um, but one of the biggest mistakes I think that, that any of us can make right now is to freeze and, and to try to move forward with no no plan or no forethought. Um, uh, if you go that, that route, your business is probably, it's going to be very, very tough to make it. So, um, we would encourage you to focus intently on the financial side of your business, particularly the cash flow position of your business right now. Take charge of your cash and your financial condition. Conserve and be smart with every single resource you, you have, because right now it matters more, more than anything. Okay. With that, um, uh, Joe and Jay, um, what final wrap up type uh, type topics or uh, things would you like to discuss right now? Well, what I'd like to say, Jim, is is that um, uh, the this crisis is with us now. It's going to be with us for a while. And if any of us are going to make it past it or even if we plan on getting out of the business, if you take a full assessment of what your financial situation is, it's going to help make that decision because if the inevitable is the inevitable, it's better to know it sooner than later. Mm -hmm. If the possible is possible, it's better to know it sooner than later. Right. Good point. Wow. That was deep, Joe. That was really, <laughs> yeah. it's so true though. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, here's my line. I, this is one of my favorite lines I've, I've come up over. Uh, I've got a few things to say, and that's what you get with Jay. I, I'm not just gonna. I, I don't have usually one thing to say. Okay. But the one thing I do, I came up and it was in a Harvard Business Review article I read a few days ago. Um, is one of the best lines, and maybe we'll I'll have to get this tattooed somewhere. But it's all crisis contains contain the seeds of opportunity, mm -hmm. and I think that is so true. As I see all these things that we're doing now in our industry. And we're reinventing ourselves, we're reinventing situations, we're reinventing menus, we're in reinventing so much. And I'm an innovator. That's in my blood. I'm an innovator. Um, I've always been an innovator. I, I, I'm, I'm one that has imagination and yeah, try to are. do things. Yeah. I, I'm the innovator at Cisco. That's just that's what I get. Yep. <laughs> and I'm proud mm -hmm. of it. But mm -hmm. I tell you what is more exciting over the last few weeks that I've seen. Because I've always had, and a lot of people I've led before and worked with, is I've always said, you, you can be innovative. I, I trust, trust me, you can be innovative. It's got to use the other side of the brain a little bit. You got to work, wake it up, and you'll get there. And to see people that were not innovators or not even in the mindset of innovation, to see them come out of this and to see people that you were like, where did this come from, this idea? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, where did you come up with this? And to see people, Putting it into action, that's even more exciting. But wow. the ideas that are coming from people right now that typically wouldn't label themselves as an innovator are innovating. Hmm. And when you're an innovator and you see other people innovating, because you're not the only one out there with the crazy ideas, and you see other people doing it, it is inspiring and it hmm. is exciting. It's, a, it's, it's amazing to be surrounded by a lot of innovators now. To, to to listen to the ideas, to, to hear what they're doing, to hear their voices, to hear mm. the thoughts, and to see them putting it into play. I, I you know, I, there's always a silver lining out of all these crises, and this is, that's why I like that line, is that that's the opportunity I see as we move forward, is these amazing things that are going to come out of this. And if we can focus on those, not on things that we just can't control, 
We don't know when we're going to open, but we can sure invent a lot of things. So when we do open, it's going to be amazing. Yes. Um, and, yes. and that's where I get excited. And, and, and just having you guys on our webinar and podcasts and all the things we're doing uh, within Cisco, uh, you know, I'm just so, so blessed to be able to work with you guys and to listen to you guys. I, I was so, I'll be honest, I, I've done a lot of shows today. I think you're number four today. I was feeling a little tired and just listening to you guys. I'm energized again. Oh, right? oh good, good, good. Right? So thanks again for <laughs> everything you do. Our pleasure. Nice. You made our day. <laughs> you know, I want to make one comment on the innovator that you, you, you mentioned, Jay, is that what's really cool about our industry uh, worldwide with restaurants is, and especially during this time right now, we're finding out and seeing, because we, we've been we've been having hundreds of interviews with, with, with members and things, is that they're willing to share that innovation. It's, you know, usually when you invent something, you want to go get a patent, not tell anybody about it, right? But no, everybody is inventing and in, 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 being innovative and wanting to share it. They, they want to yeah. see their fellow operators succeed. And that is the best part about it. Isn't that amazing? Like, yeah. I just, amazing. I don't know, but when you, when you have an innovator mindset, sometimes you feel you're out on your own. Cause yeah. it's like, it's like the Steve jobs. We're all becoming the Steve jobs right now. I hate to use mm -hmm. his name all the time, but we all are right. And when, when you have that mindset of always creating and people look to you because sometimes your ideas are a little bizarre. Trust me, I've had a few, but when you're out there all the time throwing, cause your innovation and you know, I, I have an art degree, your innovation becomes your painting or your sculpture or your idea mm -hmm. becomes your piece of work. Mm -hmm. And when you're throwing in your piece of work is always tied to a little bit of you, right? It's like a painter. When a painter shows his painting, he's talking to you through his painting about him. And when you throw your innovation and your ideas out there, you're throwing a little piece of yourself. So when you're always throwing those ideas out there and you're saying, Hey, look at the world. Here's an idea. That's a little bit of yourself. So to see everyone out there showing a little bit of what their ideas are public on you know instagram facebook on the news seeing people even sing to you know senior homes and all these things they're being innovative and right. i just i tell you it's such a it, you know to to be an innovator and to see people innovation leading right now and to be creative it, it's incredible to be yeah. in, in oh, this yeah. moment right now yeah, i can see that yeah wow. I love see with our members, they, they play idea ping pong. Okay. They, they try <laughs> to, it. they try to see how long they can keep that thing going back and forth. You know, I, here's an idea. Okay. Send me another one back and forth. And that's what the community does. And it's just awesome. Yes. Yeah, it is. It absolutely is. What an amazing industry we're in mm -hmm. to, be able to be able to do that. Right. You're right. With, with some amazing right. people. You're right. Absolutely. And thank you for the opportunity, Jay, to be able to share that with us. Uh, we, we, we love this industry and anytime we can do anything, to uh, share what others are doing or bring to the front what others are doing. We, we love sharing what others do. So absolutely. Yeah. Well you said. Know, and thanks again. And you know what, this is our legacy is right now, mm. right? Mm -hmm. This is what That's people true. are going to remember by yep. is what you did right now yep. during this crisis. Yep. They're not going to care what you did before. I hate to say yep. it. It's yep. going to be remembered on who led and came up and helped support. And stood up and spoke through these times like you guys yep. are doing. So thank you so much for everything Great. you do. Uh, we're truly blessed to be partners with you guys and, and thanks for everything. And I, ho I hope that we can have a few more of these. I know we will. We hope um, so too. And we feel the same way about you and, and Cisco Canada, Jay. Awesome. Yeah. Well, you guys, you take care. You be safe out there. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk again fairly soon. And thanks again. And everyone else, please continue to subscribe to our YouTube channel, podcast channel. We're going to keep bringing amazing people like Jim and Joe here and, and, and keep sharing you everything we can right now during these times. So thanks again, gentlemen, and uh, everyone else have a great rest of your day. You bet. Thank, Thank you. you. Best wishes to everybody. Yes. You bet.